Good afternoon, everyone, to the teams. I hope your second round and first day of the pre moot went well. To those joining us from the arbitration and legal community at large, thank you for joining us. Our final event for today will be an advocacy demonstration of this year's Bismuth problem. Council will be presenting their arguments in front of our panel of esteemed arbitrators, which includes Ian Binney, who was the Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada for 14 years. Currently, he is of counsel at Lesnir Slat, Slat and a member of Arbitration Places roster of arbitrators. John Judge is also an arbitrator on Arbitration Places roster, as well as a roster member with Arbitra International. And last but certainly not least, co-arbitrator Amanda Lee is an independent arbitrator and a consultant at Costig and King in London. She's also the founder of Careers in Arbitration and the Wellbeing Arbitration Initiative, Our Balance. Directly taking on the VIS problem is our Claimant Council team of Monique Gillison and Linda Plumpton. Monique is managing partner at Lesnir Slate and co-leader of the firm's commercial litigation practice group. Linda is a partner at Tories and is the chair of the firm's litigation and dispute resolution practice. And taking on the respondent side of the argument is Jeffrey Leon and Gavin McKenzie. Jeffrey is a partner at Bennett Jones, as well as an arbitrator and mediator at Arbitration Place. Gavin McKenzie is also on Arbitration Place's roster of arbitrators and is the founder of the boutique litigation practice, McKenzie Barristers. Now, as is true of all of our speakers over this weekend, I could talk very extensively about their careers and accomplishments. However, I will let their advocacy do the talking and turn things over to the chair of our tribunal, Ian Binney. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Raven, and uh, uh, welcome everybody uh, to the moot. Uh, as you know, the moot concerns a claim by uh, uh, Droni against uh, Equatoriana uh, Geoscience arising out of an alleged uh, breach of contract. Uh, the respondent alleges uh, uh, that the uh, claimant failed to live up to its promise and the uh, uh, claimant points out that the respondent terminated the contract. Uh, so could the claimant's team introduce themselves? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I am uh, counsel to Drone Eye. My name is Linda Plumpton. Uh, I'm joined by my colleague, Monique Gillison. All right. Thank you both. And the respondent? My name is Gavin McKenzie, Mr. Chairman, and members of the Arbitral Tribunal. I will be arguing the jurisdictional issue, and my colleague, Jeff Leon, will argue the second issue that we'll be submitting today. All right, uh, very good. The claimant's ready to proceed. Uh, I believe the respondent will be uh, going first, uh, Mr. Chairman, as it is their uh, motion. All right, respondent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the tribunal. I will be arguing the first issue in your procedural order number one, which asks whether you have jurisdiction to hear this dispute. I contend that you do not for two reasons. First, a condition precedent to the formation of the contract, namely parliamentary approval, was never fulfilled. As a result, there is no contract because the only source of your jurisdiction is contract. If there is no contract, there is no jurisdiction. The second reason I submit that you have no jurisdiction is this. On the uncontradicted facts, it is a fair and natural inference that the submission to arbitration was procured by a bribe. As a result, the arbitration agreement is void ab initio. There would be no submission to arbitration if it were not for the bribe. Again, if there is no valid submission to arbitration, you have no jurisdiction to hear this case. Let me develop each of those submissions briefly. First, the lack of parliamentary approval. The claimant's counsel point out that the cases applying the term, quote, contracts concluded for administrative purposes, close quote, all deal with the actual construction of infrastructure. That is correct. But the issue is whether there is any principled reason to differentiate between the first and second phases of a two-phase project. In my submission, there is no reason to treat necessary work preliminary to actual construction differently. This was step one 
of Equatoriana's Northern Part Development Program. And I ask rhetorically, what principled reason could there be for requiring parliamentary approval for step two and not for step one? And it's telling that both parties proceeded throughout on the basis of their understanding that parliamentary approval was required. No one suggested either before or after the contract was signed that parliament's approval was not required. And both parties knew that in fact, parliament's approval had not been obtained. The argument advanced by the claimant's council today is an ex post facto attempt to rationalize their position that there is a valid, that there is a valid contract despite the lack of parliamentary approval. My friends- just uh, uh, interrupt you there because under article 75 of the constitution, it says the submission may be made only by the minister and uh, if a foreign party, parliament has to consent. So as I read it, uh, the, the minister is approval is obviously a condition precedent that was met here, uh, but parliament has to consent, uh, does not say that it has to consent in advance. Uh, and the argument is that uh, it is open to parliament uh, uh, to approve it. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, responsibility was on the part of the government and its uh, uh, company uh, to get that approval. And it failed to get the approval and is now relying on its own failure to uh, uh, deny the claim. Well, two, two things. It was, parliamentary approval was not obtained at any point. And I was just about to reach, Mr. Chairman, um, the, the question that you've just raised to me. My friends argue, and you've put to me, that the respondent treated the contract as being in force and invoked the doctrine of ratification and good faith. And, but I submit those are red herrings. Nothing the respondent did could fulfill a condition to a valid arbitration agreement. Nothing short of the consent of parliament could do that. Under Danubian arbitration law, there is no prohibition against state parties relying on internal constitutional restrictions. As for good faith, neither party covered themselves in glory here. Parties and glass houses shouldn't throw stones. Finger pointing will get us nowhere. And that leads me in the limited time I have to the second reason why I say you have no jurisdiction, that it is a fair and natural inference that the contract was obtained by bribery. Whether that is a conclusion that a prosecutor could establish beyond a reasonable doubt in a criminal case remains to be seen. But all of the relevant uncon uncontradicted facts make that inference probable. And it is more likely than not that the contract was procured by bribery. And that's the test on this motion, a balance of probabilities. So let me list those uncontradicted facts. We know that the respondent's principal negotiator, Mr. Field, has been charged with corruption in relation to two other contracts for the development of the northern part of Equatoriana. He was arrested on February 28th, 2022. We know that Mr. Field is being actively investigated for bribery in respect of this contract. We know that the claimant's principal negotiator, Mr. Blunchley, was arrested on November 29, 2020 for tax evasion. We know that there have been two previous incidents of corruption involving the claimant. We know that when bids were initially received, a competitor of the claimant, Air Systems PLC, had the best bid, including the best price. We know that Ms. Bourgeois, Mr. Field's assistant, was surprised to learn that after the negotiations during the first week of November, 2020, the respondent had stopped negotiating with Air Systems PLC. We know that Mr. Field had attended that round of negotiations alone and that he had opportunities to meet with Mr. Blushy alone. We know, according to Ms. Bourgeois, that the revised maintenance part of the contract valued at 11,520 million euros was completely overpriced. Finally, we know that Mr. Field was not candid when he was asked about that. The claimant's counsel rely on the doctrine of separability, but separability is a presumption, not a fixed rule of law. There are exceptions to that doctrine. 
in this case, both the underlying contract and the arbitration agreement were procured by bribery. Both are void. This isn't a case where the underlying contract was terminated by breach or was frustrated. It is a case in which if it were not for the bribery, there would be no arbitration agreement at all. If the arbitration agreement is void, there can be no jurisdiction because again, jurisdiction flows from the arbitration agreement. In summary, if either of these submissions find favor with you, you should decline jurisdiction. I just uh, you know, wonder, all of your facts point to the wrongdoing of Mr. Field. Mr. Field was uh, an employee of uh, uh, the, uh, the respondent's uh, uh, corporation. How could you rely on the, the wrongdoing of your own employee uh, to avoid your liability under the treaty? Their bribery involves two parties. Not only was a bribe paid, a bribe was received. Um, so the claimant is as implicated as the respondent. But the only facts you've recited are all against your person. You haven't cited any facts against uh, the claimant. Well, I, I, I believe it's a fair inference again that um, that uh, Mr. Blanchley was involved in this and that a bribe was paid um, for, for all of the reasons that, um, that, that I've recited. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your attention. Now, if council decided that the uh, claimant initially responds to the uh, jurisdictional motion, Yes, we have, Mr. Chairman. And so uh, with your uh, leave, I will continue then with the response. Please Mr. Proceed. Chairman, thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the panel, the claimant finds itself a pawn in a political chess game currently being played out in Equatoriana. The government that entered into binding obligations with our client and then performed those obligations for over 18 months has been replaced by a government with a very different agenda that seeks to avoid those obligations and to direct the state-owned respondent to walk away. They've raised every available procedural objection to try to prevent this panel from carrying out its proper functions and adjudicating the substance of this dispute, but those objections must fail. I'll address the reasons why this panel has clear jurisdiction to determine both the initial objection to the validity of the contract and any other issues relating to its existence interpretation, application, breach, or termination. I have three broad submissions to make. The first two relate to the respondent's position that the arbitration clause is invalid because the Parliament of Equatoriana had not consented to the submission to arbitration. We say this entire argument is founded on an incorrect premise. There is no constitutional requirement applicable to this arbitration agreement that requires the Parliament of Equatoriana to consent to the submission of this agreement to arbitration. The arbitration agreement is not an administrative contract, nor can it be said to form part of one. And even if the parliamentary approval requirement applies, it cannot be used to override the respondent's obligations of good faith and fair dealing. Parties to arbitration agreements must act with fairness, reasonableness, and decency in the formation and performance of agreements to arbitrate. And the respondent has failed to meet those standards and is precluded, we say, from relying on the very legal barriers it erected and then failed to adhere to, to refuse to continue to perform a properly formed contract. And members of the panel, I will then at the end briefly dispose of the respondent's arguments relating to corruption and bribery, which I say are entirely unsubstantiated and circumstantial, and in any event can be disposed of through the doctrine of separability. On the first point, the arbitration agreement before this panel is not subject to the provision of the Constitution relied on. The Constitution relies, requires only that certain administrative contracts receive Parliament's consent. This is a normal commercial contract for the sale of goods, not a contract relating to public works. Public what works contract. Could I ask a question? What is an administrative yes, contract? Well, as defined in the Constitution, uh, uh, Mr. Judge, it is a contract relating to public works or one that I'll use the words is administratively incidental to that. 
Public works contracts, we say, are those that have as their object construction, repair, alteration of infrastructure on public property, roads, sewers, transport, public buildings. And the government, the, government wanted, the government wanted these drones to be able to collect data that they could use for the development of the, uh, the region. Why is this not an administrative contract? Well, I say first that that is one of the purposes, and I'll address the other uh, that was articulated for the purchase of the drones. But I say it must be directly related to an actual public works project. What we have here is an idea of a public works project and preparatory work involving data collection that would precede the start of anything that could ultimately exploit public land. But these drones play no direct role in the carrying out of the project. They're not essential for it to be undertaken. And their purchase, importantly, was not conditioned on any such project being approved. The whole concept of a public works project here is hypothetical. No project is identified. It doesn't have a sufficient relationship to qualify as an administrative contract. And no court decision in Equatoriana has ever determined otherwise, as we know. I mean, where does the respondent's argument end, members of the panel? Employees require food and drink. Does the contract with the catering company that provides coffee to the employees controlling the drones require parliamentary approval? Clearly not. In any event, the evidence is that the purchase of these Drones was only approved because they carry spare parts or medicine to remote areas of northern Equatoriana. That was the logic that dictated that the uh, respondents would enter into this contract. And it's further evidence that the purpose behind them is not sufficiently related to public works for them to constitute administrative contracts to which the constitutional approval requirement applies. And I note that the respondent relies on the claimant's supposed understanding of the need for parliamentary approval in their response. I simply say that the party's subjective views of the scope of application of the Constitution are irrelevant to its interpretation. And in any event, the evidence is clear that the claimant was relying on the respondent's description of the approval requirements. And in this respect, the respondent was clearly wrong. Dealing with my second argument on good faith, if the, even if the agreement to arbitrate was subject to the requirements of the Constitution, the respondent cannot rely on it in these circumstances to challenge jurisdiction. Principles of good faith and fair dealing dictate that the respondent must still be held to its bargain. You'll know members of the panel that parties to international contracts governed by the New York Convention are obliged to act with fairness, reasonableness and decency in the formation and performance of agreements to arbitrate. And to meet this standard, they must do all of the things necessary to achieve the aims of the contract. These are fundamental and internationally recognized principles of contractual ordering, and I say they are implied terms of the contract here. And the conduct of the respondent does not meet this standard and in fact presents the most stark example of bad faith dealing. My friend says, well, neither party covered themselves with glory. Well, let's look at the evidence here. The respondent did not seek to incorporate parliamentary approval into the contract as a condition or even negotiate a reference to it unlike with ministerial approval. They called off the debate to consent to the contract and then made no further effort to bring it back onto the parliamentary agenda. They continued with signing it in a highly public ceremony that received much media attention to the full knowledge of all members of parliament. They assured the claimant that parliamentary approval was a formality and would be forthcoming shortly. They performed the contract after signing, including by making payments on it, and six months after signing, they sought to renegotiate the very clause that they now suggest has no validity. Ironically, relating to transparency, the claimant acceded to this request clearly on the understanding that the contract was valid. And most strikingly, the respondent alleged breach and purported to terminate the agreement in May of 2022, 18 months after it was signed. They raised arguments about voidness and made no mention whatsoever of the argument they now advance relating to parliamentary approval, because we say they too knew that the contract was already properly ratified. We say good faith principles dictate that the respondent cannot execute, approve, perform, amend, and purport to terminate an agreement and then deny its very existence, and the panel should dismiss the challenge to jurisdiction on this basis. And finally, the respondent has raised and now argued today in paragraph 20 of its response, 
to additional jurisdictional objections that are fully answered by the doctrine of separability. The assertion that the agreement is void as the result of corruption. There has been no finding of corruption against the claimant in this case, and that's a point that Ms. Jillison will address further. The entire recitation of the facts by Mr. McKenzie was circumstantial, devoid of any evidence of actual payment of a bribe by our client. And in any event, the arbitration clause remains valid under the doctrine of separability, even if such a finding was made. And similarly, the jurisdictional challenge on the basis of termination is untenable. Clause 20 of the purchase and sale agreement is a separate agreement that survives the end of the main contract in any event. Don't uh, arbitration international tribunals rely on so-called red flags? And it's highly uh, unusual to have direct evidence uh, of corruption. And, and what the uh, respondent is arguing is that uh, uh, everybody's on notice that there were problems here and that it's unsafe for us to proceed. Well, as Mr. Chairman, as you identified, the problems that have been identified, the shadow that is cast here is around the respondent's own former employee. It is specious to argument to argue, I'm sorry, that the former employee of our client who was involved in an entirely different set of events, that that tax evasion issue somehow is any bearing on this issue. That's grasping at the thinnest of straws in my submission and a careful scrutiny of the evidence that was gone through would yield no basis on which to say that there is a fair inference of bribery in this circumstance. The suggestion is to the contrary, entirely unfair. Thank in you. summary, I think those are the submissions that we rely on in support of our position that the agreement is entirely valid and that you do have jurisdiction in these circumstances. Uh, thank you very much. I assume the claimant will Go first on the uh, stay application, Ms. Tielsen. I think Mr. Leon was going to go first because it's his Mr. Application. Leon, All right. Stay. Yeah, I think what we decided procedurally though is that if there's a, a rebuttal, that Mr. McKenzie would give it now on this issue, and then I would uh, lead on the uh, the second issue. Okay, well, the council proceed as they agreed. Let Let me be very brief in in reply. I want to make only two points. Um, my friend, Ms. Plumpton, analogizes this to employees requiring food and drink. I say that with respect, that's a false analogy that quickly and obviously breaks down. Here we have a fundamental multi-million dollar contract that is clearly preliminary to a major public works project, not analogous in any way to employees requiring food and drink and a catering contract. It's properly conceived, I say, as phase one of a two-phase public works project. And secondly, the only other point I would make is that the evidence that I referred to in developing my submission that on a balance of probabilities, this contract was 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 procured by bribery was all uncontradicted. There, there was no evidence that um, contradicted any of the um, many red flags or indications that this contract and the arbitration agreement specifically was procured by bribery. Those are my submissions in reply. Okay, thank you very much. Second issue. Uh, thank you, Chair, members of the panel. Um, the respondent uh, respectfully requests that if this tribunal does uh, accept jurisdiction, that the matter be stayed until the issues relating to the bribery, um, that is, uh, the, the conduct of Mr. Field, can be completed by Equatorium's uh, prosecutorial team. The informed prediction is that is to be by June of 2024. Um, the tribunal is obviously familiar with the allegations and concerns regarding the bribery in relation to this con conduct and in relation to this contract. Um, as there's an alternative request that uh, if uh, you, you are not prepared to stay the proceeding, that the proceeding be bifurcated. And that as set out in paragraph 52 of your practice direction number two, phase two would deal only with this issue of, of bribery. Now I start with the basic proposition um, that this tribunal 
generally and specifically under the rules of uh, procedure, uh, procedure uh, uh, applicable here has a very broad discretion as to the appropriate manner for the conduct of this arbitration. Not surpri a surprising proposition. I submit that this discretion should be used to establish a process that will result in a fair proceeding that will promote a just result, which is fundamental to the le leg legitimacy of the arbitration process and the rule of law. Again, not controversial. One given, and I'm gonna quote from the rule here, is quote, at an appropriate stage, each party is given a reasonable opportunity to present its case, the right to be heard. What is reasonable will vary from case to case. The rule goes on to say that the proceeding should be conducted, and I quote, so as to avoid unnecessary, and I just note here, it doesn't say any, it says unnecessary delay and expense. Again, the ultimate goal to be a fair and efficient process for resolution of this dispute. So inevitably, this requires a balancing. Oh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Leon, on the, this issue of unnecessary delay. That's a mandate that we as the tribunal have to ensure is met. And I know you've alluded or you suggested that the time frame you're looking at for these bribery issues would be by June 2024, but uh, it seems to me that uh, uh, we're actually looking at an indeterminate time or amount of time to address those. Investigations underway, no charges, uh, no trials. How can you say that uh, we're, we would be looking to a delay only to June of 2024? Well, I cannot say that it, it definitively would be only to June of 2024. I can say that there is a specific uh, prosecutorial team that has uh, determined that its investigation will be completed by the end of this year and that generally these proceedings take approximately six to eight, seven months uh, to, be, uh, to be dealt with. However, um, I believe the answer to your point, Mr. Judge, is that this tribunal retains control over its own proceedings. If at any time on uh, new evidence, it determines that it's not appropriate to continue the stay, it can, uh, it can reverse its, its order or vary its order, and uh, the proceeding will go ahead in accordance with how it's determined by the tribunal. But in terms of what it, the approach you should take in my submission is that there has to be a balancing process. What is reasonable in terms of presenting a party's case and what might constitute unnecessary delay? And here the balancing in my submission favors that the tribunal should conclude that a stay or alternatively bifurcation achieves the correct balance in order for a fair and efficient process. In terms of what is reasonable, I have four points. Oh, before you get there, uh, you say a fair opportunity to present a case, your case, uh, but you don't have a case at the moment. You're hoping to get one and you don't know whether you'll get one or not. So we're being asked to hold up uh, the disposition of the, uh, of the claim uh, on a purely speculative uh, uh, argument made by uh, the respondent. Well, uh, Chair, it is not entirely speculative. As my friend, Mr. McKenzie submitted, there are these red flags. And in terms of, of bribery uh, allegation, it's notorious that uncovering these complex transaction and following the, the funds that have intentionally been hidden takes some time. So that the, the existence of the red flags in my submission is enough to justify giving the respondent an opportunity to present the case suggested by those red flags. And as my, as my friend, Ms. Plumpton said, she said, well, there's no finding of corruption here. There isn't, but we want the opportunity to have this court consider the evidence and uh, make whatever finding uh, of, of corruption based on the evidence 
uh, the tribunal de deems appropriate. The, um, the investigation here is a complex investigation. It requires time uh, to, to deal with uh, uh, a bribery that by its very nature is uh, intended not to be undetected, often through a series of complex uh, transactions that are hidden. Secondly, the, the fact is that without such an investigation, it's uh, being allowed to proceed. The evidence likely will not be able to be uh, obtained because it requires broad powers of subpoena of non-parties in order to get the, the information often through institutions and banks, which are notoriously difficult to, uh, to, to obtain um, so that we need a chance to do so. And that's what we're asking for. The, and I will come to the point that there is no prejudice to the claimant if you grant this stay. The bribery here is not tangential. This is my third point. It goes to the heart of the validity of the contract in terms of it being void. It's my fourth point, it can't on its face be frivolous um, because there are the red flags that uh, my friend, Mr. McKenzie has outlined. And I would just note in relation to those red flags, because you asked about Mr. Bluntschley, um, he had two offshore accounts with unaccounted $8 million plus US. Uh, and the, uh, he was convicted in relation to tax evasion, but nobody's ever explained where he got that money. And that's the other side of the transaction. There's more, this is not your, in my submission, your ordinary case of red flags. Here you have a red curtain. And the delay here is, is necessary to achieve fairness. I've, as I've said, there's no evidence that there will be prejudice. Any prejudice that would be could be compensated by interest or a cost award, both of which have been requested. And I just note the claimant has yet to determine the amount of damages claimed. So further delay is necessary. There's strong public policy reasons given the allegations of criminal conduct. Uh, there is a, where possible, the principle is that there should be uh, inconsistent, there should not be inconsistent findings, even though a verdict here would not be binding on this tribunal. And it, Finally, it would create potential issues with respect to uh, enforcement in Equatorium based on the breach of anti-competition and a finding of uh, bribery. And as I say, you still have control over the proceedings. It's your process. If things go sideways, if there's new evidence, then you, it can be changed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Leon. Ms. Gilson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The respondent seeks to stay or bifurcate um, these arbitration proceedings until the allegations against Mr. Field have been concluded. As you pointed out, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Field was the respondent's own employee and otherwise had no connection with the complainant. And so we must look at it from that perspective. In considering whether to bifurcate, the general rule the panel must consider under Article 17 of the PCA is and again, as Mr. Leon said, there really isn't any dispute about this and, and, and this panel's broad discretion. But just as a reminder, the parties must be treated with equality, whether each party will be given a reasonable opportunity of presenting its case. And of course, the tribunal must avoid unnecessary delay and provide for a fair and efficient process. In addressing the application of the discretion, I will address whether the stay or bifurcation is fair, equal, or reasonable in light of the allegations. And finally, of course, the issue of delay. And a review of the facts and really the lack of facts in this matter demonstrates that it would be manifestly unfair to stay or bifurcate these proceedings. The respondent has been unable to point to any actual evidence of corruption against Mr. Field with respect to the contract or any other, this contract or any other contract for that matter. 
they have submitted that you can make the inference and that there are red flags, but it is all speculative. There is no evidence. It does not reach a more likely than not standard contrary to what Mr. McKenzie submitted. All we have are charges and these charges relate to other contracts unrelated to Droni, not to the one in question in this arbitration. And in assessing fairness, one must consider who is conducting the investigation, an issue that no one has raised to date, and who is proposing to bring charges against Mr. Field, that is, Ms. Fonseca. If there are red flags in this matter, it is in respect of Ms. Fonseca. She is hopelessly conflicted. She should not be investigating charges of corruptions against Mr. Field about this contract. She has two family members, or or almost family members who are directly implicated in this contract. One of them has a witness statement in these proceedings. First, her brother-in-law has an interest in showing that this contract was corrupt because he is the CEO of Air System, the competing bidder. He surely stands to profit if this contract is determined to be invalid. And this is not the only family member where there's at least an appearance of bias or conflict. Ms. Fonseca's future daughter-in-law, Ms. Bourgeois, similarly has multiple interests in the outcome of these proceedings. She's a proposed witness, and that's because she was the assistant COO to Mr. Field, who is the subject of the investigation. And query, if there was corruption, whether Ms. Bourgeois ought to have known about it. Not only was Ms. Bourgeois the assistant CEO to Mr. Field, and if there was corruption, ought to have known about it. And perhaps she'd like to, if, if there was, um, there appears to be a conflict <clears throat> of her not only as a witness, but of being appointed the head of internal investigations at the, at the respondent in February, 2022, after the arrest of Mr. Field. And it doesn't end there. Ms. Bourgeois, again, the future daughter-in-law of Ms. Fonseca, the prosecutor, became part of Ms. Fonseca's prosecutor team in May of 2022. Around the same this time- is a, This is the problem that the tribunal has. Respondent plants all kinds of red flags around the, the contract. You plant a whole lot of red flags around Fonseca and the investigation. But uh, on both sides, uh, you know, it, it, it requires the, the tribunal to make findings, very serious findings of fact in order to justify the order that's being sought. And, and the facts just don't seem to be there. Well, the, the facts with respect to Ms. Fonseca are facts. They are not speculation. But the inferences, the you're, inferences you're inferring red flags, put it that way. Fit, I'll, I'll take that, Mr. Chairman. What I say is you are being asked to stay or bifurcate these proceedings on the basis of Ms. Fonseca's investigation, and I have raised red flags with respect to her investigation. If there's going to be a determination of whether there was corruption and for that invest for that consideration to be fair and for both parties to be able to present both sides, then in my submission, it ought to be before this tribunal, which all parties admit um, and have agreed is independent. And I have raised red flags with respect to Ms. Fonseca's um, independence, and those are based in actual facts and not inference. That is, an issue of bias is whether there is an appearance of bias, and Ms. Fonseca has two. And so um, in my submission, the panel should treat the investigation as irrelevant to its deliberations because, um, because we can't... Uh, we can't know whether that investigation by Ms. Fonseca will be fair. And we do know that any assessment of the evidence by this panel will be fair. Um, Ms. Julison, if I might ask a question. Mr. Leon has said that there will be no prejudice to your client that cannot be remedied by an award of damages or interest. What, what do you say to that? In this regard, well, the 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 issue here is um, the the delay, and so this panel must um, hear this arbitration within some reasonable period, and not to have excessive delay. And Mr. Leon hasn't been able to tell you really at all when, 
um, this arbitration might be heard. So the prejudice is that we may go six months, a year, two years, and there will um, uh, and and we won't know when it will ever be heard. So the prejudice here really relates to an unknowable delay. If there was a request for an adjournment for three months, Mr. Leon's submission um, might have some weight, but he cannot tell us when this will um, be heard. And the June July timeline um, that my friend uh, raises in my submission is very uh, questionable. It, uh, it arises out of um, what Ms. Fonseca, who, as you've heard, I submit is hopelessly convicted. She's promised that the investigations would be terminated by the end of 2023 and charges would be brought. So leave aside for the moment that it is inappropriate for Ms. Fonseca to conclude that charges will be brought before she has completed the investigation. All that this tribunal has to determine about timing is her promise, that's all. There's no evidence about what work needs to be done um, or has been done to complete the investigation. And just like transit construction projects in the city of Toronto, there's nothing you can take from a promise of a leader or prosecutor as to when the project, in this case, an investigation will be complete. Even if charges are brought, it is expected that such charges would take six to seven months with the result that the very best scenario as we've heard is that a decision won't be available until June or July of 2024. We can look for some guidance at the unrelated charges against Mr. Field, which were brought in May of 2022. We are almost a year later and there's no evidence before you of where those charges stand. Why would this panel accept that the charges related to the drone eye contract would proceed any faster than the ones which had already been brought by the time the announcement of this investigation was announced? So I'd like to just, um, take you back um, uh, to the issue about these charges are against Mr. Field and not against the claimant, Dronai. Dronai is not a party to the investigation or any future criminal proceedings and has no opportunity to participate them, except potentially as a witness, but of course we don't even know that. The rules that you have to consider require that the parties have a reasonable opportunity to present its case. And if we wait for the charges and the investigation, we don't know whether Drone I will have any opportunity to print, uh, present its case. And that, um, uh, Ms. Lee, in my submission, is another form of prejudice, potentially, uh, in these proceedings. If there is a stay, um, the claimant will potentially never have a reasonable opportunity to pre present its case. Bifurcating or staying the proceedings on the theory that the criminal proceeding will determine the issue of corruption is unfair because what may be determined in the criminal proceeding will be the corruption of Mr. Field, not of Dronai. And it is not at all clear whether there is or could be any issue of issue estoppel or res judicata, even if there are criminal proceedings. So, so this panel will have to grapple with these issues regardless. And it is only fair that Drone Eye, as a participant to this arbitration, can have its case heard before this panel, as opposed to an unrelated case in which it is not a participant at all. It is only this case which will permit Drone Eye to proceed. <clears throat> and so, and I've addressed now the issue of delay. Um, so in my submission, the fair and efficient result is only that this arbitration proceed on the merits without any delay. If there is any evidence of corruption, true evidence of corruption, that evidence ought to be currently in the possession of the respondent, given the submissions uh, or the announcements made by Ms. Fonseca. We know that the state is the sole shareholder of the respondent. If the state has any evidence of payments to Mr. Field from the claimant, who was the employee, of the respondent, that evidence can be put before the panel and be addressed fairly without the risk of the biases and conflicts which exist in the prosecution proceedings. If such evidence exists, which we anticipate it does not, or would be before you now, then it can be addressed swiftly and fairly before this tribunal. There's no reason to wait for biased, lengthy criminal proceedings in which Drone Eye is not a participant, and we ask that uh, the motion for bifurcation or stay be dismissed.
Uh, may I respond, uh, Chair? Uh, yes, if uh, Mr. has concluded. I have concluded, yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I, I really have uh, three brief points. One is what uh, my friend has done here is really engaged in, in character assassination. Um, Ms. Fonseca is one of the best known criminal lawyers in the country, and uh, that's already been dealt with in your practice direction. She's a longstanding critic of corruption, and to ask this tribunal to make a finding uh, or base its uh, conclusions on her, her bias or Ms. Bourgeois' bias in my submission is inappropriate. Second, Mr. Leon, what about just the appearance? Without, without saying there's actual bias on her part, there are concerns over the appearances here. But what you're going to get is the facts. The, what we've asked for is the time for the, uh, pro, uh, the prosecution to complete its investigation, collect its facts, so that we can present the case of bribery before you. There's two aspects to this. There's the finding, uh, if it, there's a conviction, there's also the facts. And this panel, as uh, my friends have suggested, it's this panel that will assess those facts. What we're asking for is the opportunity to, to have the time to gather those facts, given that facts related to bribery are notoriously hard to, to determine. Well, at least to gather the evidence, not necessarily the facts. I mean, those have to be determined elsewhere. Fair enough. I think I'm out of time. What about uh, the tribunal making an order uh, delaying the uh, start of the hearing until June 2024 peremptory on the respondent? If you have the evidence at that stage, you can lead it. If you don't have the evidence, uh, uh, then uh, we proceed regardless. Uh, that is an order that uh, uh, we would certainly uh, be prepared to uh, uh, agree with the uh, chair. I mean, I know there, this can't go on forever, which is why I said at the outset that this tr tribunal has to maintain control over its own process. And if that's the, the view of the tribunal, that that's the longest uh, adjournment uh, or, or stay that's uh, available, then uh, I think we certainly uh, think that is an appropriate result. Well, let me ask a question that builds on uh, uh, my co-arbitrator Benny's uh, question, and that is, why couldn't this proceeding proceed in parallel? Uh, if a hearing is, uh, the merits hearing is uh, postponed or not to take place until after June 2024, there are various steps that can be taken to advance the arbitration. Most arbitrations will take, will take uh, up to a year or even more, year and a half before we get to the merits hearing. Why couldn't it proceed in parallel as the criminal investigation is ongoing and at least get through the important uh, pre-hearing steps subject to the, the challenge that the, the respondent has of adducing its evidence on the corruption point? It certainly could, Mr. Judge, and that's why, as an alternative, we've suggested that there be bifurcation, or and and that we the it's it's perfectly what the result of bifurcation would be exactly what you're saying, and um, the other advantage to what you've suggested is that um, if in the first phase, if I can put it this uh, way, of the arbitration. Uh, findings are made, the second phase may not even be necessary if uh, the findings are made by the tribunal based on the issues before you at that, at, in the first phase that the, uh, the contract ought not to be uh, enforced. So it's more efficient. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much, Council. Uh, I believe the plan now, I would ordinarily, of course, ask the claimant, uh, uh, claimant's view on this, these proposed resolutions, but I don't think that's <clears throat> the point of the exercise at the moment. Uh, I understand, uh, Ms. Cofield, that uh, you uh, expect some discussion at this stage. 
Yes, um, if anyone from the audience has any questions to ask either council or the arbitrators, please feel free to type those in either the chat or the question and answer. Um, while we wait to see if there's any questions, I just want to take a second to thank all of our demonstration council and arbitrators for their time, their support of Arbitration Place Invitational's pre moot and most importantly, for such a tenacious display of oral advocacy. I am not currently seeing any questions. So on that note, thank you all again. Um, for the well, you've got a comment. comment. Yeah, there was oh, a comment from Perfect. Mary. Any comments from the tribunal on the advocacy? Um, so well, I'll, tribunal I'll, uh, members, do you have any feedback for council? Yeah, I'll make a, a couple of comments. Uh, obviously, it was very professionally uh, presented. Uh, and the limitations on council, of course, is that there's a certain limited number of facts uh, which they have to work with. Uh, and uh, it's not possible to explore a broader uh, range of facts in order to uh, add realism to the uh, to the exercise. Uh, I thought that the, the, the strength of the presentations uh, was the, the simplicity uh, that instead of getting all caught up in minor uh, fringe points. Uh, they went right for the, the main uh, dispositive issues and were very clear in their uh, uh, submissions in, in support. So I think the, the advice to mooters is, is clarity. Uh, you don't have to get through everything. You don't have to be totally comprehensive, but what you do say should be uh, absolutely focused uh, on what it takes for your side uh, to win the point. Mm -hmm. What struck me was that all of the, uh, uh, the advocates set out very early in their, which you might call the roadmap. They had one, two, or three points. They articulated and they stated to them, stated those to the tribunal, and then they developed them. Uh, and I thought that was a, just an excellent display on all four advocates. The um, next point I noted was the handling of the questions from the tribunal. Uh, I mean, some of the questions were tougher than others. And, and uh, one of the challenges trying to sort out whether a question uh, is helpful to lead you into the next point or whether it could be an anchor. And I thought that all of our advocates uh, uh, did an excellent job in uh, listening to those questions and responding directly to them without postponing them. They were able to make their, uh, some points on that or build on them uh, and, and integrate their answers into the balance of their submissions, which I think is a very useful technique that uh, all of the mooters should consider, make sure that they're, they feel you know, they're confident in being able to do that. Um, all of our, all of our uh, advocates certainly sounded confident, even you know, whatever the, uh, the concerns they may have had going into this, they looked confident, they sounded confident, and I know from my experience at the Bismuth, as well as my past experience in court, you have to sound confident and look confident as you present that case. If you don't feel confident about it, then why should the tribunal feel confident about your submissions? And I thought uh, all of our advocates did an excellent job uh, in that respect. So, uh, uh, I mean, those are the comments that uh, I had. I didn't have any, uh, any, negative comments about our presentations. I thought there were excellent, excellent examples for our mooters to look at and, and be guided by as they uh, prepare for the uh, for the vids. I, I second everything that is has been said by my uh, my learned colleagues on the on the tribunal. Let me make um, one small point in respect of rebuttals. We didn't see much in the way of rebuttals and so rebuttals, but for the benefit of those who will be appearing in Hong Kong or Vienna, what, what we did see from, from Gavin in particular is if you've got a couple of points to make, stick to making a couple of points. Uh, the, the rebuttal is not an opportunity to throw in another five points and re-argue your case and go off on a tangent. So stick stick to your points. And if you don't have anything to say in response to the rebuttal, sometimes you can just let things lie. It's not always necessary 
to respond if there's nothing to say. So don't don't fill time just for just for the sake of it. We also saw um, good awareness of time. So Jeff, for example, uh, noted when he felt he was running out of time. So the council were obviously aware that time was passing. And that, that's something that it's really important to be aware of when you're conducting your advocacy. So in as, as I'm sure you all know, if, you, if you're conscious that you are going to potentially run out of time, it's important to ask for more time before you find your time expiring rather than waiting right up to the, to the 11th hour. So having that awareness is really important. Thank you, members of the tribunal. We do have a few other questions. Um, one of them is about the difference between live advocacy and virtual advocacy, specifically about maintaining eye contact. Um, is that something when you are um, advocating virtually, is that something you're conscious of, is looking directly at the camera? Be putting that to council. Yes, thank you. Uh, one thing I'll say is quite different um, it, it, when you're doing these things virtually is that I don't use notes the way I would if I was actually in person where I can engage with my binder or whatever is before me. I always make sure it's on screen because it becomes quite more, quite a bit more obvious if your head is bobbing uh, back and forth when you're when you're doing this virtually, as I'm sure most people on the call who've done this have experienced. Yeah, that's what I would also say. You have to learn how to use the split screen. <laughs> well, I, I'm still old school, so I use notes, but uh, I do try to the extent you can to, to make eye contact. And it, it's sometimes hard because the way these things are set up, you're not sure who to look at. And um, you know, so you have to think about it. Yes, my panel is uh, like a like a bingo card. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, if, then, you can, if you can do it, you might try to put your notes right under the camera, which can create the illusion mm -hmm. that that's exactly where your eyes are. That's a great tip. And from the tribunal's perspective, uh, it, is, uh, it is important to try and reach the point where you are looking at the camera. Uh, you know, you have to consider, uh, I, was, you know, I was saying this before we started, look at lighting, uh, look at what's behind you. Uh, are you a silhouette or can you actually be seen? And I found that in actual hearings with witnesses and uh, uh, the short examinations or the detailed cross-examinations that uh, at times you can actually see the witnesses' facial expressions better on screen than in person, uh, simply because of the distance between uh, the where the witness is sitting in the tribunal. Um, it, it takes a bit of adjustment, but, uh, and, and the fact is that going forward, uh, well, there still are virtual hearings, there are going to be hybrid hearings, even though there's a much stronger push for in-person hearings right now. And, uh, but uh, I, think you, I think everyone needs to develop uh, the virtual, uh, uh, I won't call them skills, but just uh, uh, the techniques to ensure that uh, you're looking at the camera and you have the lighting so people can actually see you. And, and, that, and that there are no distractions around, perhaps like the painting over my shoulder here, which uh, I know has distracted some people in the past. Before we, start, before we started this, uh, uh, Mr. Judge pointed out that the fan behind me was, uh, was going. And so I made a point of turning it off so that people wouldn't just look at the fan. And, uh... <laughs> you, have, you have to remember in virtual hearings um, that uh, you have to be looking at the camera, not the pictures of the arbitrators who are, as, as Monique said, like an X and O board. It doesn't help me to look at Mr. Binney down there in the lower left-hand corner. He's not going to see that I'm really making eye contact with him. <laughs> let, let, me, let me ask counsel, how do you find a virtual cross-examination when you want to look how the, at the witness and how they're reacting versus looking at the camera or do you even care about the camera when you're actually cross-examining somebody i don't use gallery view when i'm doing a cross-examination i only use speaker view so that you're only getting the one face on your screen which i think addresses the the checkerboard experience i think it's important especially when you're dealing with a witness and i would agree um mr judge that to what you said that you can 
um, actually get closer to the witness, arguably, like we're, we're sort of closer than you would be in a courtroom. Um, and if you're in, uh, you, it depends on the witness, but I would argue you may have more control over the witness uh, on a screen than you do in a courtroom separated by lots of chairs and all sorts of other things going on. Yeah, at least in the arbitration, the witness is facing the tribunal, and unlike a courtroom where the witness is next to the judge and the judge can't see a facial expression. I think the problem is that uh, you get a good view of the face, but you don't get any of the body language mm -hmm. uh, that is so important in assessing uh, credibility. Well, I don't think this a... is an issue for the moot. <laughs> if we're going to have a vote, I'm still in favor of in person. So. <laughs> I would vote for that too, Jeff. <laughs> in person is simply more, much more fun. Yeah, absolutely. We have a few people asking about whether we'll be discussing the merits. Um, unfortunately, we did only ask our demonstration council and tribunal to prepare for the procedural issues, so we won't be having any discussion on the merits today. Um, and then uh, finally, oh, sorry, even, go ahead. Mm -hmm. let, let me make this comment, at least on the merits of the motions we heard. Um, I did find that the advocacy had an influence over my thinking as to where I was going on this after just reading the material. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I was thinking about that as the advocacy was underway. And uh, um, so that's it. it I, I say that just to, sh to show you that good advocacy can have a direct impact on the assessment of the merits of whether it's a procedural point or a substantive point. And I know, okay. I know some people have said, Look at the merits. In most cases, they stand out, and uh, you know, good good advocacy can uh, uh, can win only a small minority of those cases. But uh, I think here, I uh, I think it can have much more of an impact. Um, there's also both a comment and question regarding advocacy styles. Um, so Anthony Dameses points out that all council had different styles, which were all equally effective, which is a great lesson for the students. Um, and there's a question for the tribunal, and I guess council as well, on the tribunal's style. So Mr. Binney and Mr. Judge are a lot more interventionist during the submissions, whereas Ms. Lee waited till the end to ask her questions. Um, so I guess my question then would be to counsel, how do you handle the differing styles of the tribunal? Well, since uh, we they haven't rendered their decision yet, <laughs> I think they were all great. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's so, realistic, right? I was yeah. just going to say that this is a real world experience. Every every finder of fact, every tribunal member you're before handles these things differently. You have to be nimble. Yeah, you just sort of have to match up with it. Yeah. You have to be especially nimble um, if you have 10 minutes. Um, mm -hmm. You know, what, what I found is I was pressed to get through my time in any event. And when I received a question, fortunately, it, uh, it sort of dovetailed with where I was going in any event. But, um, you know, I, I, I would have had to leave out the last half of my argument if I had fully engaged and tried to develop that point. Um, you know, more, more comprehensively. I would say I, I got the question from Ms. Lee, and, and perhaps this is unfair to Mr. Binney and Mr. Judge, but that if, if you have a panel, particularly in a longer hearing, and um, a judge or arbitrator who doesn't ask a lot of questions, then asks one, um, now this is where I'm going to offend the other two, you take it a little bit more seriously, because uh, in my view, because you think, okay, well, she must really have a question. Um, uh, and so I want to make sure I make her comfortable with this because she hasn't asked anything to date. Whereas the more interventionist ones, of course, you take them seriously, but they're once people who ask a lot of questions. And, and so you, you might spend a little bit less time on them or all you would be doing is answering questions, but you really can't think about it. If it's a hard question, you have to answer it. Um, the hardest questions you know are the ones that are potentially going to um, uh, make or break your case. It's interesting 
because I thought that the questions that did come from the tri tribunal, first from, from Ian, a few from myself and then Amanda, were actually pretty short, concise questions. Mm -hmm. And um, in my experience, it's, it's appropriate to ask the short, concise question when it dovetails with the specific uh, submission that's being made at the time, whereas a lengthier and more detailed questioning uh, you, you're likely to hold uh, until the end of a particular uh, submission or cross-examination. And, uh, and there are times when the tribunal has a lot of questions, uh, then the tribunal has to decide whether those questions are gonna be put by individual members or whether the dynamics of the case seem to dictate the questions are channeled through the chair. Um, and you know there are different reasons for doing that, but uh, but here I think most of our questions were reasonably short, in part because the amount of time council had was very short. Uh, but uh, you know, but but it was uh, uh, money. Your your comments were interesting uh, in terms of the differences uh, between us and the in council's perspective in fielding those questions from different tribunal members. But it might be totally from my uh, perspective as a uh, as an advocate. Uh, I want to know if what I'm saying is getting traction with the arbitrator or the judge. And the best way of knowing that the, it is getting traction is if the judge or arbitrator is engaging with the argument. Because if I can persuade the arbitrator at the very time uh, that the argument is being made, uh, that I'm on the right track, that's a whole lot better than having a good answer at the end of the presentation when the moment is faded. And as I said earlier, I think you have to uh, make a very quick assessment whether the question uh, is helpful to develop the argument or it's going to be a real anchor that you've got to be careful with. Well, if it's helpful or not, uh, if it's important to the arbitrator or judge, then it's important. Mm -hmm. Well, I know some arbitrators who ask questions just for the sake um, and can be a little overly interventionist. And that's another challenge when you have a tribunal member that does that, uh, but in any event. Uh, so. And there are only so many questions that the tribunal is going to ask anyway. And on a number of occasions, one of my colleagues asked a question that I would have asked had they not, <laughs> had they not done so. So sometimes it's a case of somebody, somebody raises the issue and at that point, council addresses it anyway. So I'm not going to start throwing in follow-ups unless I unless council hasn't dealt with the particular point anyway. So everybody has a different style as an advocate and a different style when it comes to sitting as an arbitrator. And that's often informed by their legal background, as, as I'm sure that you will you will all be finding as you go around the various mooting experiences in the pre-moots and in Vienna and Hong Kong in due course, you will see a number of different arbitrators with different approaches that will often reflect whether they're from a civil law or a common law background. And sometimes it's just personality. Some people are more interventionist. Some people tend to sit back and wait and see and then ask a question at the end if something is of interest. So we are over our time. So I'll just take one more question. Um, this question is that council didn't rely much on legal authority, um, and they're wondering if the tribunal prefers the use of facts and records for advocacy versus relying heavily on those legal authorities. Is that in the context of a moot or real life? <laughs> <laughs> In, in um, this... Let's give an answer for both. <laughs> we, we didn't have any legal authority, just to be yeah, for, for, for the moot. <laughs> It's mainly about the facts rather than the law. Uh, in real life, it, it, each case has certain legal strengths and weaknesses and certain uh, strengths on the facts and weaknesses on the facts and depends on which side you're, you're arguing. Uh, but um, uh, I will say this, that I have, I have been in cases where um, counsel from certain jurisdictions tend to ignore the law uh, I recall one mem memorial, a 200 page memorial that had two pages of law. Uh, that was a little thin. 
um, but it just varies case to it varies case to case on which side you're arguing. But um, certainly, uh, for the case for your case analysis, make sure you know the law and you know the key factual elements of the legal principles you're relying on, and build your argument around those facts that that, that help you. And don't ignore those that are against you. Um, make sure you address those. So it's uh, you know, and each case is different, and that's why a council has to decide which is where where does the strength lie in their case is it in the law or is it in the facts i i think that um at, at this level before an arbitral tribunal or before a court of first instance my experience is that more cases are one on the facts than on the law um i i am um, but i i think your point john is very well taken that you have to know the law i mean i i found in preparation i wasn't sure i had a good grasp of the doctrine of severability. So I did some reading on the doctrine of severability so that I could <laughs> deal with, uh, yeah, to, I, I hoped. Um, but, and, and it depends what level you're at. I mean, if you're before Justice Binney in the Supreme Court of Canada, the law makes a lot more difference um, than, than, than uh, it does when you're before a court of first instance or an arbitral tribunal, in my view. I think it depends a lot on the issue as well. I mean, the issue that uh, Monique and I were, were, were arguing it was essentially a, how the tribunal should exercise its discretion. It had three very experienced arbitrators. I don't think you need to tell them about the law. Uh, you want to convince them that how they should exercise their discretion. But, you know, I think uh, following on uh, Gavin's point, uh, wherever you are in the legal system, uh, the key to advocacy is motivating the decision maker to want to support your side of the case. And I think that it's uh, going back to the point on questions. If you, if you as the advocate can engage with the decision maker and get the decision maker on side, the decision maker is going to find a way to uh, uh, you know, find favor with your case. I mean, the, the idea that they're they're kind of ignorant of the law, that they're uh, not able to sort out in their own mind a satisfactory legal answer uh, to uh, uh, the problem of of the the fair and the just and the reasonable decision uh, is 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 nonsense. The, the judges are well able to figure that out, uh, given the written materials which would be provided. The job of counsel is to make the judge want to reach that decision. And that really goes to Jeffrey's point that uh, the, at any level of court, the, the facts are enormously important. Could I just add, I, I found um, a, a couple of the analogies or metaphors used by a couple of the advocates um, I think there's a very good lesson in effective advocacy there. I, I liked uh, Jeff's uh, comment that these weren't red flags. These are, this was a red curtain, for example. And I particularly liked Monique's um, analogy uh, to transit projects in Toronto, since everybody here will know uh, how delayed and expensive they can become. I don't know whether that would be understood by a Danubian tribunal, but- um, And I, I don't know whether I do that. <laughs> I don't know how much I would do it in real life. I was I just thought I would inject a little bit of fun um, for those of us who've been living through it. I like the catering contract for the workers. Yes, I thought I thought that was a very good uh, analogy. Absolutely. All now, right, Raven, well, you've been trying to shut us up for quite some time. I have now. been. Yes, it's a hard <laughs> task. <laughs> I'm only joking. Thank you all again for your time. It's much appreciated. And this was a wonderful display of your advocacy. Um, and I'm sure it will be of much assistance to our mooters. To those who are still on the call with us, um, if you're a mooter, we'll see you tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. for your round three. And for the rest of the audience, thank you again for joining. Tomorrow at 1.40 p.m. Eastern time, we'll have our PCA discussion. Brief closing remarks, including our thank yous to the schools, participants, panelists, and arbitrators will immediately follow. Enjoy the rest of your evening or night, depending on where you're joining us 
from. And thank you again.